Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here. Welcome to the For the Love podcast. Got a big one today, guys. We're in a series right now called For the Love of Transitions. We just kind of felt like as a team, collectively, we are all working through transitions right now. Literally every one of us, we are, tra- we are transitioning out of a pandemic. A lot of us have transitioned inside of our work, our relationships. This is just a, a, a ubiquitous space that we are all in, whether we are transitioning um, through something that we chose or didn't choose. Either way, a bunch of us are in this kind of in-between. We're from this to this. Um, we're moving from here to here. And some of those transitions are chosen. We, we make a decision that I am not going to live in this place anymore, but here, um, in whatever way we choose. Um, uh, but it could be that there is a, there are those of you listening for whom accepting truthfully, like every part of who you are so that you can live authentically is a part of your transition. Um, embracing the way you were formed, the way you are wired, um, the way that you flourish, um, who you are deeply in your soul. Um, so in order to walk on this earth as you were really meant to do, um, that is harder than it sounds because we have been handed a narrative across many spectrums between gender and sexuality and um, work environments and glass ceilings and expectations and religious constraints and geographical norms. I mean, pick it. And we've been handed a way to be, depending on what body you were born in, where you were born, um, all of it. And so it is actually way harder than it sounds to live a hundred percent truthfully in our own lives in this world. And so I, I know this, I've done this work. I, you know, if you've been around me at all, I have absolutely chosen authenticity, whatever the cost may be. And and don't throw me a parade. I lived for years not choosing that because I was afraid to lose all that I knew I was going to lose in order to embrace my actual convictions, um, my beliefs, my values, um, who I like actually really am. Um, not who my subculture wanted me to be expected to me to be. So I know about this. I know about the cost. Um, I know about the fear, but I'll tell you what I also know. I know about the freedom now. Um, the, the freedom is worth it all. The freedom of authenticity, the freedom of being one version of yourself all the time, the real one where you're not having to pick different versions of yourself, depending on who you're talking to. There's no, you cannot put a price on it. You cannot. In my estimation, it's the only way to live. Our guest today, we're lucky, man. She knows what it's like um, to choose authenticity, whatever the cost, so that she lives her most meaningful life of possibility. Um, I am honored today to welcome Stephanie Byers to the show, Kansas state representative and the first openly trans person to be a part of the Kansas legislature. Very big deal. You've obviously seen her in the news. Her journey inspired an untold amount of people. And it all started for her for knowing who she actually was. What she tells me in this interview was in kindergarten. Kinder. Um, Stephanie was elected in November of 2020. Okay. So she's kind of fresh. Um, she is the recipient of the Glisten Kansas state educator of the year and the Glisten national educator of the year. She was a career educator, um, in music. She'll talk about that. And so she retired after 29 years of teaching for the Wichita public schools, um, uh, where she was the award-winning director of bands and orchestras at Wichita North High School. Um, she's an Oklahoman by birth, a member of the Chickasaw Nation, 
And she's lived in Wichita for three decades. So that is her adult home. And she has worked tirelessly to create and operate community groups that are based in inclusivity and dignity and, and rights and understanding of diverse communities. I mean, she's really impressive. So buckle up. Um, she talks in this interview about everything, her personal um, transition um, which interestingly, she says really wasn't her transition at all. That was just simply her finally telling the truth. It's everybody else, right. <laughs> that has to transition around her, what she's learned, um, what she's leading toward. It's a powerful conversation. She's a powerful person and I'm really proud of her and I'm proud to know her and I'm proud to meet her. And, um, these are the pioneers in our world that we'll just be talking about for a really long time. The firsts, right. The ones who went first first of their kind, first in their office, first in their state. Um, and Stephanie is one of those. So we're very lucky to have her today. You're going to love this conversation. Um, whatever your experience with the trans community, I'm glad you're here today. I think today will be, it'll, it, you, you will learn something today. You will just listen and learn today. Listen and learn, listen to Stephanie's perspective, her experience. Um, uh, she just has, she brings so much to the table here um, around numerous intersections of how to be in the world. And so um, proud of her, excited to know her. Can't wait to meet her in person. Um, you're going to love her now. So I'm so pleased to share my conversation with the wise and smart and courageous Stephanie Byers. Um, Stephanie, welcome to the For the Love podcast. I'm just really honored and pleased to have you here and to have you on the show and to meet you. I've just respected and admire you for some time. Thank you. Work is very near and dear to me. And um, it's so wonderful to watch from afar. I'm now in Texas, so I don't know what that says about me, but um, obviously I have filled my listeners in a little bit about you already and kind of your story arc and, and who you are. But I wonder if we kind of, before we really kind of get into some of my questions for you, if you could just tell my listening community a little bit more about who you are um, and where you came from and, and kind of the, the plot points along the way to get to where you are today. Um, well, let's, uh, Let's start with the fact that I'm 58 years old. Uh, so that means that I was a kid in the 60s, an adolescent in the 70s, uh, an adult in the 80s. Yeah. And I became a parent in the 90s. Um, originally, I'm from Oklahoma. Mm. Um, mm. My family uh, had been there before statehood, which is easy to say when you're Native American. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, been there for a long time. Um, I'm the oldest of five kids. Um, I had four younger brothers and along the way also had wow. a foster brother. So I've, you know, big family. Um, yeah. My mom and dad are still together, still alive and mm. uh, very supportive and loving family. Okay. Um, you know, uh, went to a conservative Christian college. I uh, hmm. went to Oklahoma Christian University now. Sure. Was Christian college back then. I went to um, Oklahoma Baptist University. There we go. Yep. They're in Shawnee. Uh -huh, um, that's yeah, right. So, so I, you know, I, I grew up in, in that type of conservative Christian environment, yeah, but same. with parents who were politically liberal. Yeah. Oh, uh, and mm -hmm. of course, at the time, like most parents, they were socially conservative. Mm -hmm. um, and probably when I was in kindergarten, um, I began to understand that the, my gender, that was different than what everybody thought I was. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I didn't really have words to put to it, you know, because, you know, it's the 60s and I'm, I'm a little kid. Sure. And that language, our language has, has evolved since that time for totally. adults, let alone how do you express that when you're a child? Um, and hmm. so uh, I grew up that way. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I uh, met the girl then, now the woman who is now my wife. Wow. Um, we, we met in Sunday school. Wow. Um, of all places. And uh, oh. she was also the first person I ever came out to. Hmm. Um, and Lori has been a tremendous supporter. And, you know, we graduated high school and went our separate ways and had hmm. different lives. And they came back together a little bit later on. Hmm. Um, after graduating from college, uh, I worked as a band, band and choir director at a small yeah. private high school in Oklahoma City. Uh, went from that to a rural school in northeastern Colorado, where I taught hmm. kindergarten through 12th grade. 
uh, everything music, um, yeah. whether it was band or choir, general music, uh, to being an assistant director at a, a huge suburban high school in Arizona. Hmm. And then in 1990, uh, I was offered a job um, in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, yeah. to, so came here and this is where I've been ever since. Hmm. Um, along the way, uh, I got married. I have two sons. Mm -hmm. um, my oldest was born in 1989 and my youngest in 92. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they both went to the high school that I taught at. In 1991, mm -hmm. I became the band and orchestra director at Wichita North High School, which yeah. is the largest or second yeah. largest, depends on which week it is, um, public high school in the state of yeah. Kansas. And uh, wow. I did that until I retired in 2019. Hmm. And so... Um, you know, uh, been a, a, a long and as they say, strange trip, but you know, yeah. here I am, um, you know, I did all these things and established myself, yeah. um, as who I, I, as I'm, you know, as who people thought that I was as a, as a quality musician, as a quality teacher, mm -hmm. as a member of the community, um, as a strong parent mm -hmm. and did all this carrying the secret about yeah. my gender until I was 51. Wow. Uh, and in 2014, I wow. began living my life authentically. Mm, mm. Oh, I have a million questions. Uh, that must have been really lonely for you for a long time to care. I mean, to know in kindergarten and go all the way to 51, I can only imagine the, the just the burden of loneliness inside of that. How, um, how did you begin to find the courage to transition and be who you authentically always were. I, you know, at 51, you've got a real established life. You've got real established relationships. You have established yourself as a certain person in the world. I just, the amount of courage that, that must have taken is hard to kind of fathom. Was that, was that a long runway for you? Or once you made that choice, did that shrink up, that timeline shrink up for you? I think there are things that, that we need to kind of maybe bring up as we get into this discussion. The okay. first thing I want to say is that, you know, as a person who is transgender, I speak for myself. I don't speak for the whole community. Yep. Thanks for um, saying that. Because our lives are all very different and yep. how we, there may be commonalities between us, but, but, it, you know, just to, to understand that this is my story and not necessarily a story totally. for everyone. You're not a monolith. Um, but one of the things about it is that that existence of, of keeping who you are authentically hidden, buried um, behind while you're trying to exist on the outside hmm. uh, creates kind of like this wall inside your, your soul so that totally. who you are is behind the wall. Hmm. And on the outside of the wall is this avatar that has hmm. elements of who you are yeah. and they interact with the community and, and hmm. that's, that's who everybody sees. It's kind of like your ambassador. Hmm. Um, you can only be that way, at least for me, for so long before sure. you begin to go, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and you, you, I, I ended up feeling broken, you mm -hmm. know, most of the time, mm -hmm. uh, desperately doing everything I could on the outside of that wall to not appear to be broken, mm -hmm. to, to be, you know, everything that I needed to be for everybody around me, but lacking that connection. And that sense of brokenness takes its toll. It creates this emotional exha emotional exhaustion, yeah. and you know, emotional exhaustion that begins mm. to lead towards depression. And, sure, of course. And depression tends to lead, you know, oftentimes towards suicide. Um, and at those wrestling points, and I wrestled for a very, very long time yeah. um, with these things. A, a friend told me, who's also transgender, that you you begin to realize you're going to die. And either you're going to die this slow, painful death of the soul, as wow. she put it, where that person behind the wall, that authentic person begins to just decay hmm. while the avatar lives on and you lose that connection with who you really are. Wow. And, and that's, that's a very painful process. Or you may choose to take the quicker route and take your own life. Gosh, or there's the third choice. And the third choice is to begin to live authentically and to move into that interaction. You know, and we call that transition, but honestly, for a trans person, they're just bringing who they are out. Right. It's not really right. a transition. It's just everybody, the truth. 
right? Yeah. But every, everybody else around you is the one who transitions. Uh, uh, they right. they begin to learn right. somebody new. They begin to interact with somebody mm. uh, with with a different thing. And and that point that that where you reach that decision um, to choose to, as to which way you are going to yeah you know, finish the rest of your life. Yep. Um, and, you know, and, and we all know we're going to die at some point in time, but when you begin to live authentically, you're living oftentimes with joy, you're living with the truth, you're living with realities of who you are and getting to know everybody mm. in a new context. And so for me, that point started well before my 51st birthday. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was a tough choice to make because there's so many factors involved and, and some of them beyond control, you know, the, the, the emotional exhaustion kept heaping up and I kept trying to put it off because I kept thinking I'll retire. Uh, I don't want to do anything to mess up my retirement because then yeah. what happens, mm. you know, uh, trans people oftentimes have a hard time finding work, yeah. you know, and I had a job and he's like, you know, um, at the time I'm doing this too, just before I made this, this, this leap into my authenticity, um, the governor of Kansas at the time and our, our legislature did away with due process for educators. And here I was a career educator and I thought, now wow. what am I going to do? Wow. You know, I didn't know that. me for this. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that happened in 2012. And so it's like, they can fire me for this the school district. Yeah. Um, put their own spin on things. They put it into their contract with all teachers that they would provide due process. Wow. Um, so I was grateful for that. Yeah. You know, the Obama administration was in charge. They were writing guidances on how to deal with transgender students. Hmm. And a lot of it didn't say anything about trans adults. Right. And, you know, right. so, so it was doing some investigation with the district to find out what they would do. Cause there was no specific policy in place. Sure. You know, it, it, it wasn't that it was something new. Um, but it was something that hadn't really ever been explicit, explicitly put out there. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, but it, all, the, all the points of contact seemed to kind of come together and it just made sense that it yeah. was time. <clears throat> and so actually the school district contacted me uh we we had had kind of an exchange going back and forth emails about the hypothetical if a, if a teacher was to transition mm. uh and then when i finally said hey i'm the i'm the hypothetical teacher yeah. um you know and and i'm really wrestling with this uh mm. then one of the one of the members of the school board or the uh, the superintendency area our equal equal employment opportunities officer contacted me and said how can we make this happen wow and so wow so when they reached out to me uh, in the beginning of summer 2014, I kind of, first of all, it's something I had to do. It's something I needed to do. But then I also began to realize there were a lot of things that needed to be cleaned up before I made that, that final leap. Sure. I had to talk to my sons. My sons didn't right. know. Right. Wow. You know, um, my, my now ex-wife, uh, right. she was, was visiting with my parents and she told them what was going on. Uh, and I got this wonderful heartfelt later letter from really? my mom wow. you know, that started off with, this is the hardest thing that I've ever had to write, but I just want to let you know that we love you, your dad. And I love you no matter what. Oh, um, hmm. and so all those doors opened at one time Gosh. and, and it was, it, it, it was time. Mm. And so we made the choice to go through that door. Mm, that must've been overwhelming to manage. Um, kind of in such rapid succession. Uh, I'm really, I'm so pleased to hear about your parents' reaction to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, which is so um, not always the case. Um, no. And I'm, I'm so glad to know that you were loved well and that your, your colleagues, your, your workplace, even were, I'm, I'm just, that's a wonderful um, report on your story. Um, so <laughs> it's just crazy because as if that just wasn't enough to, um, manage and move through and, and shoulder and, and work through in your relationships, you just thought, well, you know what now seems like a good time to run for office. <laughs> I'm bored. I, I need some place for this emotional energy that I just freed up to go. Um, and so you made huge waves um, in the political sphere when you became the first openly trans member of the Kansas legislature. It's just profound. Um, I'm, I, I would love to hear you talk about that 
decision, first of all, um, having been a career educator, what moved you into politics, complete departure. And then I would love to hear you talk a little bit about your campaign. And I'm curious if you, I'm sure that you did, had to address misconceptions or ignorance or even hate from your potential constituents. Kansas is notoriously a, a conservative state. Um, and so I, how was, how did you find that process? Cause you were still kind of fresh and new, generally speaking in your authenticity, but that was still kind of in its, in its early stages. And so you just, you must be made of sturdy stock is all I can guess. <laughs> <laughs> you must be, um, you know, it's, I suppose for some people, there's like a defining moment where they go, this is it. This is, this is where I made that decision. This is the, you know, the catalyst or the impetus. Mine kind of spools up over time. Hmm. Um, partly, you know, being a public school educator meant, especially here in Kansas, uh, watching education budgets get frozen sure. repeatedly. Uh sometimes from bad decisions, but, but uh, often, you know, well, a horrible decision during the Brownback administration here mm. where they cut taxes so badly, the state was on the edge of bankruptcy. Yeah. Uh, and education, of course, is one of those big, big monetary things for a state. And yeah. so it receives, you know, horrible cuts. And those cuts meant that textbooks weren't getting replaced, yeah. that, uh, you know, the cleanliness of buildings was changing because of the amount of time we could spend with custodial oh. staff um, mm. and teacher salaries being frozen. Um, you know, so, you know, I went a number of years without even a cost of living increase in my, wow. my pay, but also being this high school band and orchestra director, there's not a lot of time outside of the class to go and say something to people in power who make sure. sure. And so it's just this frustrating feeling that you're at the mercy of somebody else. Um, and so that kind of played in the back of my mind. Um, after I began living authentically, Probably maybe a, a year later, um, I found myself on the steps of the uh, Kansas State Capitol uh, speaking at a rally where we were talking about bathroom bills and the mm -hmm. impact that it would have on the trans community. Mm -hmm. And so this this advocacy that I'd had before, which really was was geared in you know towards the arts and, and in music in particular, um, you know from the stage talking with parents about supporting the arts and keeping involved in education mm -hmm. and the importance, I shifted that over. Hmm. to advocating for people like me yeah. uh, and and just the ridiculous nature of being told you can't go to the bathroom somewhere um, because, you know, you, there are elements of your body that don't match your gender identity. Yeah. And so I started speaking on those things, you know, before that time. Um, and as life just kind of progressed along, uh, my principal called me up one day in January of 2018 and just said, Hey, I want to let you know that I've nominated you for some national award. Hmm. And I said, what national award? He goes, have you ever heard of this group called Glisten, G L S E N? And of course, by that time I've been working with Glisten for a couple of years here in Kansas. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I said, yeah, sure. And he goes, well, here's the award that I've nominated you for. Here's what I told you. So if you hear anything about this, let me know. <laughs> and that was it. And okay. then a couple, a couple of months later, um, Glisten contacted me and hmm. said, we'd like for you to uh, write something. We, we need about a page from you um, because you've been nominated and, and we're asking all 150 some odd candidates hmm. that have been nominated if they would write something for us, then we'll do an interview process. And, and next thing I knew uh, in 2018, I had been selected as the Glisten yeah. National Educator of the Year, um, which put me out on a bigger platform. Totally. You, there's a responsibility when, at least for me, transitioning on the job mm. did not mean that I went, you know, quietly. It didn't mean that it was invisible. It was just something, it was a very public thing. I'm sure. Um, and, and as you, you can imagine, being from the Wichita area, Wichita North High School, about a third of the community of Wichita went to that high school at some point in time. Sure. And they're still very well connected. If they're here in town, they pay attention. Mm. And so it was not this, this anonymous activity that I did totally. it was on a very public platform. And I felt like I couldn't remain quiet. I had to speak, had to say mm. some things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we went through all of these things. And then in 2019, when I retired, it was an opportunity for me uh, to do some personal stuff. I had promised that I would spend six months 
not just saying no to everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, yes. to get my, get my feet underneath me for retirement. Mm. Uh, cause I've, I, I taught for 32 years. It's Gosh, you time. deserved six months. <laughs> yeah. Like that's fair. And, and, um, you know, so, so we were kind of approached it that way. Uh, in the process of doing that, I became the communications director for Wichita Pride. Uh, and um, mm. so we were having our Pride Festival of 2019. And in Wichita, we do it in September yeah. because it's Kansas and June's usually kind of miserable as far as weather goes. Sure. Um, so September's much more pleasant. Uh, and so uh, one of my jobs, besides being the spokesperson for Wichita Pride, then um, I have a convertible. I was driving our then Lieutenant Governor, Lynn Rogers, and his wife, yeah. Chris, okay. in our Pride Parade. Mm. And I've known, I have known Lynn and Chris forever as all three of their kids were a part of my band program. Sure. You know, so before yeah. he was Lieutenant Governor, before he was Senator Rogers, before mm. he was School Board President yeah. Rogers, I knew him. Got it. And uh, so, so that was a relationship we'd had for a while. While we're setting up for this parade, and I'm sorry, this is a long drawn out story. I love this, it. Keep going. This is the truth of it. Um, while we're setting up for this parade, my parents were here helping out. My mom's walking through the crowd, the staging for the parade, handing him a bottle of water okay. and just saying, you know, hi, I'm Steph's mom and hand him a bottle of water and walk, walk on. Okay. She came to where Lynn and Chris and I were talking um, before the parade started, uh, introduced herself. And I said, mom, are what, what exactly are you doing? And she told me, <laughs> okay. I said, you realize that there's like 150 people here who know me, but there's a thousand people <laughs> right. around here. So I, uh, they're, they're probably just wondering who is Steph? Staff. <laughs> you know, um, that's cute. And, and mom stops and she looks at me just, well, oh. I'm campaigning for you. Oh, I said, but I'm, but I'm not running for anything. Mm. And she goes, well, you never know. And then she went on her merry way to, to go hand wow. bottles of water out to other people. Mm -hmm. When the parade started, uh, having done, I don't know, 150 parades probably as a yeah. high school band director, right? they're very involved. People think yeah. it's just, you know, walk down the street and play some songs. No, you're uh -huh. running through, making sure your kids' shoes are all tied, making sure, sure no one's overheating. You know, you're yeah. making sure that some kid's not trying to get into the middle of the band to grab some candy that got left, you know, totally. trying to avoid and keep everybody safe. When you drive a car in a parade, <laughs> yeah, all you do is don't run over the person in front of you. Yeah, it's pretty standard. So, so while we're driving down the street, we're talking in the car, and we're talking about what my mom had said. Mm -hmm. And next thing I know, the Rogers are beginning to brainstorm different offices they thought that I would be a good fit for. Like in the car, this is in what the you're car saying. During the parade. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe you know, school board elections are coming up. There'll be an open seat on the school yeah. board. You know, maybe the county commission will have a seat for you. Uh, perhaps we just start small, small and be a precinct chairperson. You know, it's, it's this kind of a conversation. <laughs> and so we finished the parade. We had our festival. Uh -huh. uh, at the end of the day, the, the pride board is all meeting together to, to debrief, decompress the day. And I'm talking about this conversation that had happened with the Rogers. And um, the president of our pride board said, you know, you live in House District 86. I know because the same district I live in. And um, the representative for District 86, Jim Ward, has uh, announced that he's resigning that seat as he's running for state Senate. So that seat is open. Hmm. So and this is this is, of, this is the end of September of 2019. And he said, so, you know, if you're interested in running, talk to us and we'll see what we can do about how, how we need to approach this and what we can do. And, and he's kind of a, a political operative. So he has some ideas of what this is going on. I said, well, I'll think about it. The next day, this is the last Sunday in September. The next day, the, that Monday, I get a phone call from Glisten that hmm. says, hey, there's going to be this big rally in Washington, D.C., outside on the sidewalk, outside of the U.S. Supreme Court yeah. building. Uh, they're hearing the oral arguments on Bostock versus Clayton County. Yeah. Uh, and we'd like for you to come up here and be the voice for Glisten and for Glisten to represent educators and, and mm. students who are, you know, a part of the LGBTQ community, mm. uh, Bostock versus Clayton County. It was, you know, deciding whether or not the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Title VII, right. if on the basis of sex does include gender identity and right. sexual orientation. And so they said, we'd love for you to come up here. So a week later, it's October the 8th. Gosh. Um, they flew me to DC and I'm standing out on the sidewalk. I followed the, the first openly gay member of the NBA 
you know, which mm. you know, I'm looking up to somebody who's a foot and a half taller than sure. I am, you know, kind of thing. Uh, I'm looking around the crowd and it's, it's a who's who mm. of, of the LGBTQ yeah. community on the national political spectrum. I mean, supermodel Gina Ricaro standing yeah. in the crowd yeah. kind of thing, you know, and so mm. I walk up to the mic and, and I, and I make my speech and, you know, I'm standing there with the U.S. Supreme Court building in the background behind me and ahead of me, the dome of the U.S. Capitol building. Um, it's a big deal. The side of me is, is, is this huge opposition rally uh, yeah, going right. on. And across the street mm. are the, the protesters from Westboro yeah. Baptist Church. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm being handed an opportunity to do something <laughs> more than just make a speech. Yes, that I can actually maybe help craft policy. I can actually maybe yeah. help make law. And I came home and I said, all right, let's see, what, what do we need to do? How do we go about doing this? You had about and five minutes to pull it together by that point. I mean, did you, did you have an immediate team who kind of rallied around you to get you ready? Our budgets are so different sure. you know, in everything we're dealing with this, but so it's a small team. And, um, it, it uh, really was basically me, yeah. uh, my wife, my yeah. daughter-in-law, my son sometimes would help out, you know, um, and some friends. Uh, yeah. And um, and you just bootstrapped it. Just bootstrapped it together. And, yeah. uh, but, you know, I live, I live in a district that for the last 30 years has voted Democratic. And mm. so running as a Democrat mm. in the district was helpful. Okay. Um, yeah. Our demographics are are really the a little more than a third of the district are unaffiliated voters. Um, a third are Democrats, and a little less than a third are Republicans. Okay. And, but at the same time, being a trans woman running for office, we had no idea what to expect. I how could you? And it's unprecedented. And so, Exactly. And, and so, you know, the first thing we did was, you know, how, what do we do with my status being transgender? Is that something that we put out there as a yeah. major thing? Is this something that we, um, we just, it's matter of fact, or is it uh -huh. something that, that, you know, for a lot of people, I, people will notice my voice, but they don't, they don't notice much else about me. They just take me for who I am and they don't yeah. think about the fact that I'm transgender. Um, so do we just let it be buried? Uh, and, and of course mm. I, I, I talked to my consultant and I said, well, you know, Google my name and what comes up. And the first thing that comes up is transgender teacher wins national award. I said, okay, so that's, yeah. it's there. Yeah, it's there. So we're not going to bury this. This is a known um, quantity. But, but we didn't make it the main issue. I mean, yeah. we made it the main, the main issues we voted that we're working on are the main issues for, for every Democrat in Kansas, sure, expanding Medicaid, yeah. you know, uh, fully funding public education. Yeah. And as the pandemic were on, we began to realize that our, our unemployment's really a mess here. We need mm. to figure out ways to shore up that safety net for everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, and so this became the issues that we dealt with. Early in the process of running for office, um, my opponent was interviewed uh, after by, by a news organization that interviewed me first. And she was asked directly, are you going to make an issue of Stephanie's status as a transgender woman? Yeah. And her response was, no, we're going to focus on taxes. We're going to focus on education. We're going to focus. And she said those things mm -hmm. and then she remained true to her word. Wow. Wow. And uh, the, the rest of the party, you know, because oftentimes we're running for office, what the candidate does is one thing, but the party sure. may do something. But the rest of the party kept, did the same thing. They kept that out of it. Wow. And, you know, wow, so, I'm surprised so, to hear that. I really am. So, the biggest, the biggest things that I ran into uh, in, in, in campaigning, besides campaigning in the pandemic means you're not going out and knocking a lot of doors, you know, you're, right, you're of course. not doing a lot of, you're doing a lot of things very differently. Yeah. But even when I would go out and, you know, hang literature on doorknobs, uh, I would talk to somebody. And usually when people said, said something to me that was a negative, it was mm -hmm. that I was a Democrat. That was the only oh, thing sure. that was really a negative thing. That's way but, worse. Oh, I, vote, I, I love <laughs> yeah. the things you say, but you're a Democrat. So, you know, <laughs> totally. um, right. And, and, and that was mm. it. And mm. so it was very wow. surprising. Of course, yeah. it was kind of the same, the same thing that happened when I, when I started teaching and living authentically, uh, I figured there would be, you know, yeah. stormtroopers at, at sure. school board meetings over these things. It was no. nothing. Hmm. Uh, not until I won the national award. When, when I got the, the Glisten Educator of the Year Award, then I did have Westboro Baptist show up yeah. at Wichita North High School in protest. Wow. But they did it on the sidewalk while we were inside in a pep assembly. And yeah. 
It was right. the last pep assembly of the school year that year in 2018. Oh, yeah. And the kids chose the theme of rainbows. And so you walk into the gym and 2,200 kids with rainbow flags and trans right. flags and little oh rainbow tattoos on their faces. Hmm, and, I have goosebumps. And, you know, signs up to say you love who you love. And I mean, ah, uh, that's incredible. It, it, and four people that had unloaded out of a tired old minivan with signs that said really nasty things right. standing out on the sidewalk who right. were there for 30 minutes and then right at 30 minutes got up and left, you know. <laughs> Right. Right. Who's actually so pitiful here? Thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that story. I'm so happy that you told that. I, I have five kids and they're between 15 and 23. So that's my age group. And, um, they're just, they're special. They're different. Like I'm, I'm so hopeful for, for trans kids and, and all kids in the LGBTQ community, you and your generation did a lot of trailblazing that was, unprecedented that it it, it didn't have language, didn't have context, didn't have it in sort of the cultural milieu. And now these kids have us, we have a long way to go, but there is a sense of safety and belonging and authenticity that their age group values. And it's exciting to watch. It's really wonderful. And they're standing on your shoulders, of course, um, because you have gone into places as you are authentically um, where that's not your only thing. It's not just that you're trans. It's that you're a legislator, legislator making important changes in your state. You get to just live a normal life. And it's it's, um, I, I've got a, I've got a, a gay kid. I've got one on the spectrum and I'm just so grateful for the grownups in the world who went ahead and lived true, lived true, no matter what the community was saying at the time or the culture, what we understood or didn't understand. Great stories are powerful, right? That's why I love this podcast. We get to hear people from all walks of life, talking about their obstacles and their wins. And you know another place we get to do that? The Gin Hatmaker Book Club. And I want you to join today because if you love this podcast, you're going to love the book club. Here's the deal. Each month, we'll dive into a fantastic book and we read all kinds of stuff, fiction, memoirs, self-help, all of it. Every single book is something I have read and loved. And I just know you will too. After you sign up every month, I'll send you a box with the book and other fun treats. Plus your membership comes with a whole slew of perks. You get resources like reading plans, weekly summaries, discussion questions. Plus you get tons of exclusive community stuff. You get access to our private Facebook group where you can connect with me and all your fellow members. And there's a monthly Facebook live chat session with me and sometimes some surprise guests. Sometimes I pop into the Zoom meetings of our local chapters, which is always delightful. Plus, we do some cool stuff with the book's author. They curate these awesome Spotify playlists just for us. Plus, I record a podcast with the author or another special guest, and we talk about the book. It is an incredible way to cap it all off. And you know what makes a book club great? The people. This community is the kindest, most supportive group you can possibly imagine. So sign up today at jenhatmakerbookclub.com. We are here waiting to welcome you into the sisterhood with open arms. So join us at jenhatmakerbookclub.com today. Okay, back to our show. We are fully into summer. School is out. The summer solstice has come and passed. The heat wave is here to stay. But as I was thinking about these summery things, I was also thinking about seasons. Just like we have summer and fall and winter and spring, so also do our lives go through seasons. Sometimes things feel sunny and carefree or delightfully like crisp and, and chill, or we just need to go into hibernation so that we can thaw to emerge stronger. So no matter what season we are in, one thing I've noticed is that I am at my own best when I stay committed to my regular therapy sessions. Better help is for any and all seasons. That's because it's professional therapy from the comfort and convenience of your own space. Their licensed professional counselors have a super broad range of expertise 
specializing in everything from depression, stress, anxiety to trauma, family relationships, LGBTQ issues, grief, you name it. Plus, you can start communicating with a therapist in under 24 hours and you'll get thoughtful and timely responses and you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is also committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. That's why they make it easy and free to change counselors if you need to. So as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash for the love. Join more than 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash for the love. Now that you're in a position literally to make positive change. You are a policy maker. Now you did exactly what you set out to do. What do you, what moves do you want to make? What, what are you interested in? What are you eyeballing in terms of creating a safer Kansas for the people that live there? Um, p- maybe particularly inside the LGBTQ community, you know, you, we've got legislation right now going, you know, on the floor in Texas, that's just so dangerous for our trans kids and our trans community. And, yeah. I mean, we're still right here in the hot, in the hot button of, you know, making the, our legislation is going to go this way or this way. What do you think? Well, I think we're seeing um, a knee jerk reaction. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's, it, I, I don't know. And, and I hope that I am right on this, that we're seeing this last gasp of breath from discrimination, you yeah. know? That, that at least with the LGBTQ community, we've got a long ways to go with, with racism. We've got a long ways yeah. to go with ableisms and, yeah. and we can start adding all these isms that, that, mm-hmm. that we still wrestle with as, as a nation, but we're becoming a nation that's more accepting. Hmm. And because we're seeing that, that's why, that's why we see more, what seems like that there are more trans kids now than there used to be. It's probably not more, right. it's just that there's, there's, they feel safer to be able to that's express right. who they are. Yeah. So, you know, when, when you think about, you know, for me at, at 13 in 1976, the only trans icon at that time is Renee Richards. Mm. And, you know, if you were trans you, and you were outspoken about it, you were risking your very life. Of course. Just being, yeah. you know, um, and, and so, and that, that hasn't changed in some places in other places it has, but I, I think that, that we're seeing with this legislation, we're seeing these groups that have lost control and they're using us as ways to gain control. Yeah. Um, the frustrating thing about a lot of it is this stuff is focus grouped. It's not like someone just said, Oh, this is a good idea. So the anti-trans kids and sports bill in Texas is almost word for word the same as the one in Mississippi and the uh, one in Arkansas hmm. and the one that we saw here. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's done by a national group um, sure. and, and it's, it's put out there um, as a wedge issue. It's hmm. been intentionally crafted. They tested it when I guess it was the, in the Tennessee governor's race hmm. um, to see how it would play. Um, and it fell very favorably, although their candidate didn't win uh, the governorship, hmm. but the the messaging polled well Mm. and you know what sucks about this is we're talking about real people here and they're talking about numbers and percentages Mm. and you know um Mm. and so you know i i'd love to see this this end i would i would love to see as as a member of this legislature that we make progress in those ways yeah you know it's it's been interesting because like you had said earlier um we saw this bill come through the Kansas House, hmm. uh, went through the Senate, and I mean, actually it went through the Senate first and then came back over into the House hmm. um, because we managed to, to keep it from coming into any committees on the House side of things. Um, hmm. On the Senate side, it got, it got approved, then it, came, then it got added into uh, a, a bill that had been stripped out that they just switched the contents of that number. Um, you know, it's... It's just one of those processes of legislation uh, and it came to the house side, but after it was voted on people that voted for it came to me and apologized. I was going to ask know. you this. Mm. Wow. So, so there's a, there's a change of heart, but not a change of backbone. Mm. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's still, well, 
This is what my party says I have to do. I mean, we know people that yeah. were so upset about possibly being forced into having to vote for this that received permission to leave the house and be someplace else. So when it came to vote, they didn't have to vote for it or against wow. it. They could just be a non-vote. Wow. Um, and, and this is and, because you know, so, they're risking their funding. They're risking their good standing inside their party. All this. All this. Exactly. Yeah. And, but, you know, the fact is that they do know that what they're doing is, is going against the grain of history. Sure. And, you know, mm. so hopefully they'll be more willing to speak out. I mean, I, I had uh, one member of a Republican party come and talk with me in the hallway after I had um, given testimony against the bill when it was in committee and said, you know, you need to know that, that this is tearing our party apart. Wow. There are a bunch of us that disagree with this. That's interesting. But we're younger and we don't have the power. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I'm like, you need to stand up. You, you hmm. need to, if you don't take a stand, you're never going to gain that power, hmm. you know? Um, and, and so hopefully we can we, we see those changes take place, you know, mm -hmm. and we know that, that the law is not perfect by any means and yeah. constantly having to be revised to make sure we're doing this. I mean, here in Kansas, uh, the main groups that uh, contract with the state to provide for adoption services, no, they right. can exclude yeah. LGBT couples yeah. because of deeply held religious beliefs, yeah. um, but they're operating on, the, on behalf of the state. Hmm. not on behalf of a church. Right. Uh, you know, right. and, and so is that fair? Is that right? Hmm. Um, Kansas has it written in their state constitution that marriage can only be between a, be between a man and a woman. Hmm. That's the constitution here. And we know that the Supreme yeah. Court Obergefell decision right. overturned that. But that's a co Supreme Court decision that yeah. can then be reversed hmm. when the right case comes up. And yeah. we see the other right. side playing this, this long drawn out chess game to get these laws put back in front of the US Supreme Court to reverse those decisions. Mm. So Bolstuk versus Clayton County, where it does allow that definition of on the basis of sex to include gender identity and sexual yeah. orientation, that's gonna be challenged. Yeah. These, these laws that we see that are going to court. So when the ACLU is suing the state of Arkansas over the decisions they've made, which is the right thing to do, yeah. the other side gets the right to appeal. And so part of this tech, this, this chess game is to get that put back up to the U.S. Supreme Court so that those decisions that they, th they don't like could be overturned. Hmm. Um, you know, and so it's, it's just trying to make sure that we do what we can to make everybody feel safe you know, and to make sure that, that we progress, that, that yeah. we've got, uh, that we extend rights to people, not take rights away from people. Mm. What's your take on, this is a lot of energy to put toward anti-trans legislation. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. It takes up a lot of time. Um, why, <laughs> why? When we have so many other um, issues that matter to all Americans, um, when we've got all this education to work through, when we have health care to work through, when we have legit unemployment, we there's there's so many very real salient things um, for our 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 legislation to put their energy toward. Why is it that that this issue continues to have an outsized amount? of momentum and, and energy, which affects such a very small amount of the constituency in our country. I just, I guess I'm still baffled. I, I, is it just simply because it plays well with voters? Is that the deal? What is the deal here? Especially when I hear you say you have Republican colleagues come to you privately and say, we're not all in here. You know, I, I, I believe you. I believe that that's true. So I just, I feel, I think I feel bewildered that this continues to be such a hot button that they'll just press and press when it causes such destruction for such a small amount of people. Well, I mean, you know, as you say, it's, it's such destruction for a small amount of people. I mean, as a part of that community, this is a tremendous thing. It's huge. tremendous. I don't know. I mean, I, I am not a conservative politician. I have really no clue what their mindset is on these things mm -hmm. other than 
the things like they're just this, that they just don't have anything else to work with. Mm. Um, mm. We saw here, we saw here in Kansas during the primaries, three individuals running for the Republican nomination for U.S. Senate from Kansas, and all three of them made trans mm. kids in athletics an issue. Yeah. And, you know, mm. I, I, I was quoted in a national paper about they don't have anything else to talk about. Mm. So they're going to pick on trans kids yeah, because they they can't, they can't figure out any other platform that they need yeah. to bring up that they can actually make a difference. Mm. Well, and uh, it, it presents them an opportunity to claim some sort of invented moral high ground, which plays well, that, that plays exactly. well with their voters, um, this sense of um, moral outrage, uh, which is really manufactured, as you said. I'm so interested right now in elevating and celebrating good things. So community, I'd like to introduce you to Abel. If you're not familiar with Abel, they are an ethical fashion brand that employs and empowers women as a solution to end poverty. (laughs) Love. They're deeply devoted also to quality, both in the products they make and in the quality of life they aim to provide. So they invest in, train, and educate women so they can earn a living, break the cycle of poverty, and thrive. And would you believe it all started with scarves for them in Ethiopia? They met women coming out of the commercial sex industry who asked for help finding jobs. So they trained them to make scarves. And after selling over 4,000 of them in two months, they knew they were onto something. And now Abel has grown from hand-woven scarves to a whole lifestyle brand with leather bags and clothes, shoes, jewelry, and more. I have so much of their stuff that I wear on constant rotation. I cannot say enough good things about Abel. Truly, come check them out for the cause and their incredible business practices and stay for the fashion. You can get 20% off site-wide with my code 20 Gin at livefashionable.com. So that's 20 Gin at livefashionable.com. I do a lot of work around the um, just LGBTQ dignity and rights too. And my, my experience um, in the community is that, um, that trans folks are the least understood um, of the letters, of all the letters. Um, they're, they're, it's the most misunderstood. Um, obviously, they receive an out size portion of violence and discrimination, um, hate crimes. Especially trans folks of color. Oh, absolutely. At that intersection. women of color. Yep. Yes. That's the um, most dangerous category um, to be in. And so I wonder what you would just tell my listeners here as we sign off. Um, Obviously, I, I do appreciate you saying you're not a spokesman for all trans people. No one is. Um, no one is, but from your perspective, from your experience, how would you talk to us about becoming more understanding, more compassionate, more inclusive, more accepting and kind-hearted and generous toward trans kids, trans adults? Wow. Uh, you know, first thing is, is, is quit struggling to understand, just be kind. Oh, great. I love that. You know, I mean, and that's, that's the bottom line to it. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, trans people struggle mm-hmm. to understand why we are the way we are. We, you know, as, as science spends more time studying trans folks and the differences, um, we have a better understanding of possibilities, um, you mm-hmm. know, but we're, we're convinced that this sense of gender is immutable, that it's completely connected with biology, no matter what. And yet science is telling us, you know, gender is actually more broad based than sex. Hmm. Um, and it's something that we need to consider. And we, even now we realize that sex is not as confined as we thought it is, hmm. that there are more variations on those, those, those physical attributes that, that create that sex in us. And, I, you know, we, I, I think that as an educator, this is one of the ways we understand this a lot. We understand that the math that we learn in school mm. is not all there is. 
Hmm. Right. We see, God, you know, it's as, so true. As, as somebody, as somebody who managed to make it through algebra two, <laughs> same. You know, and then I see people who are doing trig and they're doing these these hmm. advanced, you know, math, and and, hmm. and I'm just like, wow, that's incredible. But for yeah. some reason, we think high school biology is the end all, hmm. and yeah, we don't understand right. that that it that's just the beginning. Hmm. That was just design, and so we need to get to get to that that broader understanding that that it's an open door that there's yeah. more knowledge out there, um, and so that we don't need to get hung up on XX and XY. Yeah, as being the only chromosomal because you know we're finding out that sex is not even necessarily XX and XY anymore. Mm. That there are more there are more things with it, and the more we understand DNA, the more we under- sure. unravel those those type of things. We began to understand that, and so being transgender, um, it just is who we are. Yeah, you know, um, and I, I don't know. I mean, it. I I, I did tell the the 125 members of the Kansas house, uh, on the floor, I said, I have no idea what it means to be cisgender. Hmm. Uh, you know, that my gender identity and my biological sex, the sex assigned to me at birth, yeah. those have never aligned in my right. life. I right. don't know what that feels like. Yeah. Uh, and so I can understand why you might have a hard time understanding hmm. what it's like to, for someone to be transgender sure. because that's outside the realm of thinking for you. Yeah. Um, Hmm. And, you know, but, but if we just focus on, on treating each other with kindness, totally. you know, take people with who, at, at who they are. That's good. You know, because the irony to me of beginning to live my life authentically. And the first thing that happened is people that know me for a long time, accuse me of lying about who I am. Oh gosh. Yeah. And it's like, no, I, technically I was lying before, right? you exactly. know, and now I am not. Hmm. Um, and and, you know, just trying to, to understand those things that, hmm. that sometimes you just go, I don't understand it, but I can be kind to you. Yes, and absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and it's our work also to resist the messaging that we hear that paints the trans community as um, dangerous or trying to take something that doesn't belong to them or that somehow just your existence is an endangerment to this vast majority. That's just um, a lie. It's a lie. And so in fact, of course, the trans community is incredibly vulnerable and yes. very tender and they deserve allyship and protection and rights. And so um, it's exciting that you're up there banging the drum um, especially in a state like Kansas, that is thrilling. That's thrilling. Like we expect to see some of this coming out of a more, you know, progressive state, but this to me feels like this is how meaningful change happens. Um, that, that Stephanie Byers gets elected in Kansas. This is, it's a big deal. And I'm really proud of you and I'm grateful to you, um, for the amount of courage that it takes to do what you do. And I don't think you'll probably ever even know how the impact that your influence will have had on our, our culture and on our country. It's, it's very, very profound. And um, the weight of it is not lost on me at all. So thank you for your incredible um, diligence and honesty. Thank goodness you hit age 51 and said no more. Um, because now of course, but that you're living your best life right now, um, your most meaningful life too. And so well done, um, keep going, keep rising up through the ranks. We'd love to, we'd love for you to be governor. Why don't you just set your eyes? <laughs> You've got time. You've got time. You're not uh, in band anymore. You're not running concerts. <laughs> just think about it. Just think about it. Um, <laughs> and thank you for your time today coming into my community and talking so candidly about your story. It's so great to hear and um, continue to learn from you. So cheering you on from Texas. Well, and thank you. And of course, you know, people can follow me at Byers for Kansas yep. uh, on Twitter or at Byers for Kansas on Facebook. Uh, I don't think I have anything on Instagram, but you know, so we can't keep up. I told no. my kids, I'm like, I'm not doing TikTok. I'm just not doing it. I can't do it. I can't do another one. I'm just, I'm old and I don't want to know a new thing. So that's fine. We'll find you on Twitter. We'll yeah. find you on Facebook. Um, okay. Stephanie, thank you so much. I'm so happy to meet you. If I'm ever in, up in Kansas, I'm going to pop into your office. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. 
Okay. You guys, I got so enamored with Stephanie's story. (laughs) I forgot to ask her what was saving her life right now. I just, I just got flustered. I think I got a little starstruck to be honest with you. Um, Isn't that great? Isn't she great? Just, I just drew a lot of inspiration from that conversation and courage from it. Really? Like I borrowed from a little bit of her courage and, um, proud of her. I'm really, I feel, um, grateful that we have such good leadership right now in our generation, still fighting for rights and dignity and the inclusion of all of our American citizens and protecting our vulnerable communities. I, I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged when um, politics is so discouraging by and large, what we hear and the noise and the fighting and the, the just the always in the silos and the, anger and the fear mongering. And so getting to sit down with somebody like Stephanie for an hour, it just feels completely different. Like, oh yeah, right. This is the, this is where governing is good for us. When we have, we're represented well, we have representation. Um, We have advocates and policymakers and um, just anyway, go follow her, go follow her. We'll have, if you go to jenhatmaker.com, Under the podcast tab, um, we'll have this entire episode, including show notes, all the links to Stephanie's socials, minus Instagram. We could try to peer pressure her on that too. Um, Kansas listeners, shoot her an email. Thank her for being one of your representatives um, and leading your state so well and with such inclusivity and meaningful change. Um, So good job. Good job, Kansas. Congratulations on having a good one. Okay, you guys. Uh, More to come in the transitions series. Um, So whether a transition happens to you or you choose it, there's still so much to learn from the courage that is required as we change, as we evolve, um, as we move forward. So come back next week, more to come. All right, everybody. Have a great day.